Hello and welcome to episode one of the all new Reaching for My Roots Family History Podcast. My name is Ash McPhee. I'm a former print journalist and dead set history nut based in Australia. Throughout the course of future episodes, I'll be delving into the historical stories behind some of my own ancestors, as well as at times filling you in on my own personal family history researching shenanigans. And believe me when I say this, there are some definite shenanigans. I'll also occasionally look into world events, literature and other forms of media that may have helped and shape and or reflect the life experience of my ancestors. At various times I made me to have some guests on the show to discuss their own stories as sort of an ordinary people of extraordinary ancestors theme. Personally, as much as I love watching TV shows such as Who Do You Think You Are, it's always been my belief that you don't have to be a celebrity to have an amazing heritage. So when I embarked on my journey to the print media back in the late 1990s, my first editor jokingly said I had a great head for radio and an even better voice for writing, so now that I have my own show, I'll do my best to prove that second claim wrong. Anyway, enough about me, and on to episode one of the podcast. Before I do go any further, I want to thank the Australian War Memorial and Discovering Anzacs websites for having so much information available to the general public which has helped me greatly in putting together this particular story, some of which I've used verbatim, such as unit movements and general descriptions of battles. Also, bear with me on the pronunciation of French and Belgian locations. I've done the best I can, but ultimately it will come down to my Australian accent on how it actually sounds to you. This episode, I'm going to talk about Clarence William Wignall, the young man who packed a whole lot into the first 21 years of his life. Clarence's connection to me is through my paternal grandmother's side of the family. My nana was the daughter of Arnold Gutterson and Margaret Louisa, born Wignall, known to all and sundry as Nana Lou, who was the daughter of Edmund Wignall, the brother of Clarence's father, Alfred. That makes Clarence a first cousin to my great-grandmother and ultimately a first cousin three times removed to me. A little bit of Wignall family background. The family originally hailed from the city of Preston in Lancashire, Northern England, it is believed that a William Wignall who served with the Queen's Light Dragoons is ultimately awarded a medal at the Battle of Waterloo and is a relative auto due to the fact that the name William Wignall was like John Smith in the Preston District. I'm yet to completely connect the dots. Either way, whatever he did to receive a medal certainly set the scene for the exploits of a young Clarence pretty much a century later. Thomas Wignall, grandfather of Clarence and three times great-grandfather to me, was born in 1821, and by the age of 18 was in big trouble with the law. Whatever crime he committed, which may be an episode in itself for the future, he was ultimately given 15 years and sent down to Port Arthur, which unfortunately was where the violent crooks were sent. He also had tattoos, which was something that only the hardest of hard asses had in those days. Having said that, he was granted a ticket of leave well before his sentence was completed and became an outstanding citizen for the rest of his days. After gaining his freedom, Thomas relocated to North Central Victoria and married Mary Ann Summerell, herself the daughter of convicts Charles Summerell, my earliest ancestor who were to arrive in Australia in 1806, and Mary Webb, who was an inmate at the infamous Parramatta Women's Factory. Charles and Mary will feature quite prominently in a future episode as they have a very interesting story to tell. Alfred Wignall was the 10th of 13 children born to Thomas and Mary Ann who had by this stage well and truly settled in the district of Euroa, approximately 160 kilometres or roughly two hours drive in modern times from the capital city of Victoria, Melbourne. In 1891, Alfred married Rachel Finkenstein, with 10 children coming along in the ensuing years. Unfortunately, their second child, Everett, only lived to be one before passing away. Another son, also named Everett, came along a year later and was followed by Clarence two years after that. I mention Everett now as he does have a reasonably significant role to play in Clarence's journey. As children, Clarence and Everett would have experienced the official birth of Australia during Federation at the turn of the century and would also have no doubt heard tales of heroism by Australian troops in the Boer War fought in South Africa. While still teenagers, both would have had front row seats to what historians consider the true day that Australia came of age as a nation, the Gallipoli campaign, which I will get to pretty soon. Like many local lads, both boys found themselves as military cadets in a local militia group based out of the Seymour Army Camp, now known as Puckapunyal, 
in 1909 to commemorate the visitation of Lord Kitchener to the camp as part of his inspection of Australian land-based defence forces. A medallion was given to the cadets. I've seen a photo of the one Clarence received and it does have his name engraved on it, which is pretty cool. Life went on much as usual for the next few years. However, the shadow of war was hanging over Europe and eventually exploded in late July of 1914 with the assassination of Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Within a couple of days, Britain had declared war on Austria, Hungary and Germany as a conflict on the European continent looked inevitable. Australia and New Zealand joining on the side of Britain on the 4th of August with the Australian government pledging an initial force of 20,000 troops to aid Britain. Something I did not learn in school was how the first Australian Imperial Force was formed and the existing laws that surrounded Aussie servicemen fighting outside of our shores. We were always taught that recruiting officers were flooded immediately by young men wanting to go on an adventure and promising to do their bit, the latter of which was true. However, the law at the time, the Defence Act of 1903, prohibited the members of the Australian Army from entering an overseas-based war unless they had first volunteered in a special military force. Clarence and Everett thus were able to join up straight away, doing so on the 18th of August at the Seymour Recruiting Office. At the time, there seemed to be some confusion as to Clarence's correct age. On his attestation document, his age is listed as 18 on the first page, although you can clearly see it has been altered from 17. And then a couple of pages later, it is written as 19, Whilst the photograph on the Australian War Memorial website has a caption where it says he was just 16 prior to embarkation. Being a family history nut, I did consult my genealogical documents and discovered that Clarence was born on the 1st of August 1897, making him 17 on the day he walked into the recruiting office and signed his papers. Being that he was there with Everett, I'm sure there may have been some brotherly assistance in convincing Officers of him being the legal age to go away and fight. Interestingly, at the time, you were supposed to be 21 to join up unless you had your parents' permission. So I'm actually curious as to whether the boys had Alfred's blessing or not. During this process, the lads were required to swear the following oath in the presence of their attesting officer. I swear that I will well and truly serve our sovereign lord, the king, in the Australian Imperial Force until the end of the war. So help me, God. What really strikes me every time I read the two brothers' attestation forms is their regimental numbers. This is the chronological order of when they joined up, Everett being number 19 and Clarence number 20. They were the 19th and 20th soldiers to join up in the entire army, which eventually saw 330,000 military personnel and 3,000 nurses serve. Just let that sink in for a moment. Considering Australia's population was approximately 5 million people in 1914, that's an incredible 15% of the entire population. The brothers underwent a thorough medical examination and were found to be free of a wide range of conditions that would deem them unfit for the duties of a soldier. They were also found to not have the tattooed letters D or BC, with which the British Army marked deserters and those of bad character. The examining medical officer stated that Clarence, quote, can see the required distance with either eye, his heart and lungs are healthy. He has the free use of his joints and he declares he is not subject to fits of any description. I consider him fit for active service, end quote. Volunteers such as Clarence and Everett were sent to training camps, established in military bases, farms, parklands and sporting grounds around the country. They're given basic military training, including the use of rifles and small arms. Clarence was issued with his uniform, a khaki woolen jacket, heavy cord breeches, and a famous slouch hat. Turned up on the left and featuring a plain khaki band, chin strap, and rising sun badge. Having said that, though, the previously mentioned photo on the War Memorial website does show Clarence and the majority of his mates wearing the pre war militia forage caps. Only the Tub Brothers. Frank and Feder Frederick were adorned with slouch hats. Amongst the soldiers' equipment was a mess tin, known as a Dixie, a water bottle, a mug, .303 Lee Enfield rifle and bayonet. The .303 rifle was still in use after being standard equipment in the Boer War 15 years earlier and always reminds me of the movie Breaker Morant, 
where the catchphrase Rule 303 was used as a defence during a court martial. I think at some point I'll do a review of Breaking Morant as it is an outstanding piece of Australian cinema. Clarence and Everett were assigned to the AIF 7th Infantry Battalion led by well-known Lieutenant Colonel Harold Pompey Elliott, also featuring the then-ranked Lieutenant Frederick Tubb, his brother Sergeant Frank Tubb, who would both go on to distinguish themselves highly in future battles, 18-year-old Alfred Collins, later killed in action, and Evergreen Boer War veteran Peter Pinder at the sprightly age of 57. The battalion is made up of roughly 1,000 men with four battalions grouped together to form broader brigades. The 7th Battalion formed part of the 2nd Brigade of the 1st Division. The 7th departed Melbourne aboard the troop ship HMAT Harata on 19th of October, just 72 days after Australia joined the war. The Harata was one of many ships requisitioned by the government for wartime service, transporting the troops and equipment and was bound where further training would take place in preparation for what was to come. For a lot of the men travelling to Egypt, it was an enormous adventure as very few had even left their home state, let alone been overseas. Along the journey, the ship stopped at Albany in Western Australia, where they took on supplies before continuing on an epic four-week voyage across the Indian Ocean to Egypt, which has been described as the longest journey to war in the history of the world. Whilst at sea, the men were required to perform exercises and training drills, as well as doing their own washing, sweeping the decks and carrying out other chores. Three hearty meals a day were served. Breakfast usually consisted of porridge, stew and tea. Lunch included soup, meat, vegetables and pudding. Meat, bread with jam and tea were served for dinner. I'll tell you what, that sounds like a pretty good um, book to be in, that's for sure. Many of the troops experienced bouts of seasickness on the voyage which was pretty unfortunate, but that's how it was in those days. So to alleviate boredom, sports carnivals were held with boxing matches, pillow fights, which is kind of interesting, and wheelbarrow races. And while crossing the equator, Neptune's journey was played out on each troop ship, which I have yet to be able to find a recording of that anywhere, so I will look that up at some point and put it on the um, Facebook page. Eventually, the ship arrived at Aden before sailing up the Suez Canal to Egypt, where the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps was formed and christened under the Anzac name. In a few months' time, the Anzac legend would be well and truly forged in battle. While they were here, they embarked on a tough training program made up of marching through pretty horrid sand, digging and attacking trenches for eight hours a day, six days a week, but also finding time to take in the sights of Cairo, riding camels and climbing the pyramids, for example. Many had their own cameras and took photos of their mates at the top of the Grand Pyramid in front of the Sphinx. Some of the Australians gained a reputation for rabble-rousing and running riot in Cairo's red light district, the Wazir. In interesting. Uh, one of my other great-grandfathers was involved in an incident here, which I will bring up in another Another episode, quite an interesting one. I'll say no more than that for the moment. For a reasonably good representation of this sort of behaviour and act activity, the 1981 movie Gallipoli and the Anzac TV series from the mid-1980s do a really solid portrayal and are worth watching to see what it was like. A few months later, in April 1915, Australian troops boarded ships heading to the Dardanelles in Turkey for their first taste of battle and what would go on to be named the Great War or First World War to those of us in these days. The 7th Battalion landed at Anzac on 25th of April 1915 as part of the second wave. But things got off to a bad start. Landing at North Beach, their landing point was overlooked by an Ottoman machine gun post which opened fire, inflicting heavy casualties and causing some boats to drift off full of dead and wounded. A total of five officers and 179 soldiers were lost in the landing. In early May, the 2nd Brigade was transferred to Cape Hellas to help in the British attack on the village of Krithia. Like many battles in this war, the attack captured little ground, but cost the brigade almost a third of its strength. The 7th lost another six officers and 87 men with very little to show for it. 
absolute disaster, really, like the whole entire campaign. The Victorian battalions forming the 2nd Brigade returned to Anzac Cove to help defend the beachhead, and in August they fought at the Battle of Lone Pine. In fierce fighting, four Victoria Crosses were awarded at Lone Pine, the Corporal A.S. Burton, Corporal W. Dunstan, Lieutenant W. J. Simons, and Lieutenant F.H. Tubb. Tubb, Burton and Dunstan were engaged in ferocious hand-to-hand and bombing action, holding a trench against relentless Turkish counter-attacking. There is a great documentary called The Power of Ten, hosted by Ben Robert Smith, that was hosted on the Seven Network in Australia and is available as well on YouTube, which pays a fantastic tribute to this. I definitely recommend you watch it and even more definitely put aside any defamation of Ben's character by the media in recent times, which, in my opinion, went over the top and whether it's founded or not, they took it too far. And Ben is an absolute war hero and what he does on on this documentary is just amazing. The tribute he pays to a lot of really good Aussie and New Zealand heroes, it's definitely worth a watch. I highly recommend it. After a tough campaign on the Gallipoli Peninsula, the battalion was part of the final stages of a brilliantly executed evacuation in December 1915, where no lives were lost and the Turkish forces were kept none the wiser, until afterwards, of course. By this stage, Clarence and Everett had been in the AIF for all but 14 days at a war to date and were active for every day of the Dardanelles campaign, being amongst the earliest arrivals and the last to leave. More than 10 officers and in the vicinity of 300 men had perished in a fruitless campaign out of the approximately 1,000 that made up the original 7th Battalion. So that's about a third gone in, well, it's what about, say, eight or nine months. Both Wignall brothers made it through and were now headed to an even more brutal setting on the Western Front after a short stay in Egypt to recuperate the remnants of the battalion. Here they prepared for trench warfare on the Western Front, including training with new types of weapons and learning how to deal with poison gas attacks before sailing directly to Marseille, joining their units in northern France and Belgium. The battalion's first major action in France was at Pozier in the Somme Valley in July 1916, where the 1st, 2nd and 4th Divisions formed the right flank of the British Front. The 1st Division was committed to the attack on Pozier Village from the 23rd of July, involving the reduction of the Gibraltar blockhouse, among other tasks. The enemy shelling was relentless and casualties mounted at a horrifying rate. I really do wonder how Clarence was coping in this new environment, I mean, considering he was still only 18 years of age and already near enough to two years into the war. I don't think anything could compare to the daily horror being experienced and having a son myself at the time of recording who's a similar age to what he was at the time. It really does amaze me how much more mentally stronger Clarence and the other boys must have been to endure what they did back then. The windmill was captured by the 2nd Division on 4th of August and consolidated by the 4th Division, which then saw the direction of the Australian assault switch to Mukay Farm, with the 1st Division leading once again. The aim was to outflank Tepfel, the main impediment and key objective of the British advance. The AIF divisions had fought themselves to a standstill over five weeks with 23,000 casualties, of whom 5,000 were killed. Now, if you put that into perspective, 1,000 young Aussie men were being killed every week in just this one single battle. By comparison, the most recent conflict in Afghanistan had Australian involvement for 20 years, and our forces suffered only 36 deaths during the entire course of action against opposition forces, with about another 200 other casualties. So that's yeah, pretty horrific what they went through back in 1916. Just scary to think about it, even now, to be honest. After Pozier, the battalion fought at Ypres in Flanders before returning to the Somme for winter. And then 1917 came along with a German consolidation of their front line and an orderly withdrawal through what were called the outpost villages, through which they conducted a delaying defence. Just If you've seen the movie 1917, where there's all these empty spaces and it looks like the Germans have moved back from the initial positions to basically rebuild and recover. That's what they were doing at the time. And that's, that movie is actually pretty accurate in the way they've done that. 
The AIF was tasked to follow this up, culminating in April with the first of two assaults on Bully Corps, of which was the first was an exclusively 4th Division attack, which, although successful in breaking into the German line, was not adequately supported and subsequently it failed. The second attack followed in May involved the 1st, 2nd and 5th Divisions. Tactically, it was very similar to the 1st, with a break-in being achieved, although the tanks failed again and inadequate artillery support was provided because of difficulties getting the guns far enough forward. From a casualty perspective, it was Pozier all over again. The 1st Division was reconstituted and reinforced during the period May through to July, when all of the AIF, for the first time including the 3rd Division, was committed to the 3rd EAP campaign, also known as WIPERS to some people who don't know the Belgian pronunciation, but we'll call it EAP. The 1st Division was committed to fighting at Menin Road in late September 1917 at the Brutzinder Ridge, I hope I said that right, on 4th of October, becoming bogged down in the misery of Passchendaele during late October and November. It was in the Battle of Ypres that Clarence first received the decoration for bravery. By this stage of the war, he was still only 20 years old and had spent three straight years in country in combat roles for the majority of that time as well. He was awarded the Military Medal for the following, as explained in the Commonwealth Gazette, number 31. Near Ypres, on 4th of October 1917, Lance Corporal Wignall, when in charge of a pack train, displayed great courage and devotion to duty. During heavy enemy shelling in which one man of the pack train was killed and four others injured, he brought the wounded men out of the shelled area and placed them in shell holes in comparative safety. Had them conveyed to the dressing room station and then collected the scattered pack train, carried on and completed his job. You would think that was enough and he'd kick back with a few cold beers and a story to tell his future descendants, but not Clarice. Three days later, he was back in the thick of the action, saving lives under fire yet again. From the Commonwealth Gazette, number 66. At West Oak Ridge, south of Ypres, on 7th of October 1917, Lance Corporal Wignall was in charge of a party loading pack animals. When the enemy commenced, shelling the position very heavily. Several men were badly wounded. Regardless of the heavy fire, Lance Corporal Wignall remained at his post attended two of the wounded men and placed them in safety. He then procured stretchers and had them conveyed to the dressing station. He displayed great personal bravery and presence of mind throughout the whole period by his courage and prompt actions, set a fine example to the other men and doubtless saved several lives. Now, those two descriptions make it sound like he was just doing his job, but let's be real about this. There were enormous bombs landing all around him, blowing huge craters into the earth and he showed amazing bravery, despite the risk of being blown to pieces at any given moment, so that he could get his mates back to safety, and then, as any good country boy would, he went back and took care of the horses while still under fire. Now, excuse my language here, but this man is a fucking hero. I can't think of any other way to describe it. I have li literally teared up every time I read those two dispatches, and I'm feeling it well up now, just talking about it again, knowing that Clarence Wignall showed exceptional bravery against all of the odds at 20 years of age. At 20, the most dangerous part of my job, working on the docks, unloading shipping containers, was forgetting to put my lunch in the fridge on a hot day. So, yeah, like, wow, just what he did was just unbelievable. The battalion helped to repel the German spring offensive in March and April 1918 in Flanders. The AIF had been sent south to bolster the British 5th Army, which was crumbling in front of the German onslaught. Then it was realised that an attack was to be made in Flanders as part of Operation Georgette towards the rail ahead of Hasebrook. So the 1st Division was rushed back to be told by British General Harrington on arrival in Hasbrook Station that they, the 1st Division, were the only formed body of troops between there and the Channel ports Calais and Boulogne. They became a rallying point around which other troops consolidated and the Operation Georgette attacks were blunted. The troops of the 1st Division were later transferred to the Somme once again to take its place in the Australian Corps, consolidate under General Monash's command for the Great Allied Offensive, the last 100 days campaign, beginning on 8th of August 1918. 
The first division started the Amiens offensive in reserve, but was later committed to the left flank along the Somme, taking part in actions around Chippy E and Chiyun across the Somme towards Bapom, securing the right flank of the British Army while it advanced on Bapom. It also allowed the 3rd Australian Division to cross the Somme and secured Australian Corps Northern Flank for the attack on Mont St. Quentin. The 1st Division fin finished its last phase of combat operations in the vicinity of Ipi, as opposed to Ypres, which is a different place, on the approaches to the Hindenburg Line. After the 2nd Division attack on the Beauvoir Line at Montbrihin, on the 5th of October, the AIF was withdrawn from the line to reinforce and refit following the accumulated losses it had sustained since the 8th of August. At 11am on the 11th of November 1918, Germany signed an armistice that would bring the war to an end. In cities and towns across Australia, people celebrated in the streets. The headline on the front page of the Melbourne Argus read, The City Rejoices. And a report in the Sydney Morning Herald noted that the Inspector of Police and instructed his officers to give reasonable latitude to persons who may be inclined to somewhat boisterous behaviour in their peace celebrations. And so it was across the country, finally at peace after a war that had left over 60,000 Australians dead and 156,000 Australians wounded. One of the highest casualty rates of any of the Allied countries. I just want to say in regards to that, there were some times where the Aussies and the Canadians and some of the other colonial New Zealanders, maybe some of the Indian and, and African divisions as well, were cannon fodder. They were lambs that were slaughtered. They were just chucked in ahead of the, the other attacks in and against the machine guns, artillery, God knows what else. It was hor horrible. It was horrific. So no wonder we had such high casualty rates amongst the colonial troops anyway. So, yeah, so the battalion, along with the rest of the IAF, was resting out of the line when the armistice was declared and the long process of repatriation and demobilisation began. For many, resettling into civilian life after the turmoil of the battlefield was not a straightforward process. Many were struck down with the legacy of multiple woundings, in some cases amputations, Injuries received from gassing, which is, oh, God, I mean, it's just horrible. And what we now know is PTSD, which back then they called shell shock, and it was kind of, I don't know, it wasn't really taken as seriously as what PTSD and other sort of similar mental health aspects of war are uh, taken in, into consideration now. A lot of blokes died young, and it's a staggering statistic, but 50% of the men who returned from the war were dead from multiple causes within 20 years. No doubt, elevated by the onset of the Great Depression. The legendary Pompey Elliot took his own life during this time, exemplifying the fact that the effects of war did not discriminate by rank or station in life. Others lived on to lead very productive lives, rendering further service to the community, marching every Anzac Day in memory of their fallen mates until they too succumbed to the passage of time. Clarence returned to Australia relatively early I guess, compared to a lot of the other blokes. On the 20th of November, 1918, only nine days after the armistice was signed. All told, he served for four years and three months with more than 1,400 days spent in country. That's just unbelievable. That's, that's, that is a lot. A lot of time to be away from your family, your friends at, at that age. I mean, he spent every single day from the first landing at Gallipoli to the armistice in combat zones whilst... Mostly still a teenager. He did actually finally, surprisingly, he had a charmed life, but he did receive a gunshot wound to the thigh on the 9th of August 1918, almost four years to the day since he joined up, and just on two months before the end of hostilities. I'm going to add to this by saying he was still a very young man during the Spanish flu epidemic, or was it a pandemic, whichever, that wiped out another huge chunk of the world's population post-war and then survived the Great Depression a decade later. By the age of 33, he'd experienced three momentous worldwide catastrophes. That's staggering. I mean, it's way too much to endure. It's, yeah, for a guy that young, male, female, whatever, to be someone that young and goes through that much is, is, is too much. 
However, Clarence being the man he was, volunteered again in 1942 to serve his country during the Second World War, being assigned to the Volunteer Defence Corps 3rd Battalion, which was charged with providing local intelligence, you know, like looking for spies and that sort of thing, and defending Australia in the event of an invasion, which was a pretty big fear at that time, especially considering Japan were just absolutely annihilating Pacific nations daily. Luckily for him and his family and, and I guess for the whole of Australia, he wasn't called upon to fight again this time because we weren't invaded. The Japs had a couple of landings that didn't really go to plan. They decided Australia was a pretty shitty place to fight a war and they took off and went elsewhere. But look, to be honest, I reckon had the invasion happened, Clarence would have pulled his finger out and done his, done his bit again because he was just that sort of bloke. I mean, if it was me, I would have just been sitting back reading the newspaper and listening to the radio every day and saying, you know, good luck to the boys out there, but I've done my time. Not not, not old mate Clarence. He was, a, he was a bloody hero. So, yeah, um, a year later after the war, Clarence married Caroline Colwell in 1919 and they settled down to life in Melbourne's leafy eastern suburbs around Camberwell, which, if you know Melbourne, it's pretty, it's a pretty nice sort of area. I couldn't afford to live there myself, so he must have done all right for himself in business and whatever else. And they stayed there until they passed away in old age, and they they did live to be pretty old, which is like just amazing. I'm starting to well up a bit thinking about it, to be honest. So yeah, their son Jeffrey and his wife um, Edel ventured to Gallipoli on Anzac Day Eve in 1966 doing some exploring and discovering more than 20 war cemeteries that had popped up in the preceding years after the war. They wrote down the names of all the 7th Battalion heroes and collected a bag of pebbles from the beach in Anzac Cove for Clarence, which like, I'm sure he appreciated. Might have brought back some pretty horrific memories, but, yeah, he would have loved it. And as a side note, Edel is a renowned Australian author of children's books, which are really, really good, and I'm not saying that because I'm biased. In 1988, Clarence and three other Aussie diggers were awarded a further honour by the French government, as announced in the following press release by Ben Humphreys, Minister for Veterans Affairs, titled Australian World War I Veterans Awarded Legion of Honour. And it reads, four Australian World War I veterans leave today for France, where they will be presented with the French Legion of Honour at a ceremony to mark the 70th anniversary of the liberation of... I'm going to have a crack at this, Vio Bretano by Australian troops on 25th of April 1918. In announcing the visit, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Ben Humphreys, said that he was delighted about the awards and that it was a great honour for the veterans and the Australian people in our bicentennial year. The Return Services League, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Trade and French Embassy in Canberra are to be congratulated on arranging this visit as part of the three days of Anzac commemorations to be held in France in honour of the 50,000 Australians who died there in the two world wars, Mr Humphrey said. He continued, the four veterans are Mr Robert Harris, 93 of Pennant Hills, New South Wales, Mr Fred Hocking, 91 of Ivanhoe, Victoria, Secretary of the Gallipoli Legion of Anzacs, Mr Ronald Morrison of Bentley, Victoria, and Mr Clarence Wignall, 91 of Melbourne, who won the Military Medal twice at Ypres. The decorations will be made by French Defence Minister M. Giraud during a military ceremony at Vio Bretonneau, which will be followed by the unveiling of a plaque commemorating the liberation of the same place by the Australians, Mr Humphrey said. So that was really sort of it for Clarence after that. He had a couple more years of of life with the family and, and then he passed away of old age, which is what he deserved. He, you know, he fought his ass off um, along with all of his mates in the First World War. It wasn't an easy time for him. He was still bloody young at the time and, and to be able to live well into his 90s and just just have a happy life you know, for 70 more years. It's just, man, that just, it just makes me so happy. Uh, but this guy, he just personified what Australian men were all about back in those days, you know, just over 100 years ago from now. Um, I don't know what else more I can say. Um, 
I, I haven't got the words because I just don't f find myself to be in anywhere near the, this, the high esteem that Clarence should be held in. I'm just, I'm just amazed. Like somebody in my family was, did something so significant. And without even thinking, he just went and did it. He did what he had to do. He did it for his mates. He did it for himself. He did it for his country. He did it for the horses, even. Like, he just, yeah, he just, unbelievable. So, so yeah, that's the end of my first podcast. I hope you enjoyed hearing the story of Clarence Wignall, my first cousin three times removed, Australian war hero. I'll be back soon with some more. At the moment, I'll probably do one a fortnight try and maybe do one a week at some point but the research does take a lot of time and I guess I'll we'll see um, how the listener response is and yeah we'll see you at the next one and keep an eye on the Facebook page Bridging for My Roots History Podcast for some updates on what's coming next and I might even post a, a playlist of the sort of music that was pretty popular during the First World War particularly with the Australians this there's some pretty cool little songs here. I've, I've listened to a couple of them this afternoon and yeah, they are quite interesting. But until then, I will see you and I hope you enjoy living your life, which has been made possible by guys like Clarence who did what they could to give us the life we have now. <laughs> you know, lest we forget their sacrifice. <laughs>